The Annapurna Circuit is a trek in central Nepal that climbs to an altitude of 5,400 meters through Thorongama Pass, one of the highest trekking passes in the world, below peaks that rise 6,000 to 8,000 meters in elevation from the Annapurna Range. We hope to complete the trek in about 15 days, starting mid-December, when the shoulder season promises much smaller crowds, but with it, a risk of avalanches, frostbite, and the chances of losing one's way in the deep snow that early winter can bring to the pass. The Annapurna Circuit has often been voted as the best long-distance trek in the world, though road construction is threatening its reputation and its future as a classic trek. We started our journey in Kathmandu and couldn't wait to escape the hustle and bustle of modern Nepal for the mountains. The trek normally begins at Besi Sahar, a seven-hour drive from Kathmandu. We decide instead to continue on to Chamje by jeep to skip the first two days of what we heard would be mostly dusty road so that we would have more time to spend acclimatizing later on at higher elevations. The trek follows an established and well-marked route making numerous river crossings over steel and wooden bridges. Passing first through lush rainforest with waterfalls seemingly every 200 meters. And plenty of wildlife. But for the first couple of days, the mountains remain shrouded in clouds. Tea houses and lodges along the circuit are available for meals and accommodations, with villages typically no more than one to three hours apart, allowing for a fairly flexible itinerary. In the off-season, however, we are finding that many tea houses, and in some cases entire villages, were closed for the winter. But the ones that had remained open were very welcoming and appreciative of the business. Side trails have been established to offer new excursions to trekkers to lesser visited towns. Some as alternate routes and others as separate multi-day camping treks. This could provide trekkers with some of the atmosphere lost over the years from overexposure to tourism. Namaste. Namaste. Although many of the villages have managed to maintain their charm. Third day, we woke up to clear skies and got our first glimpse of the surrounding mountains.
The old village of Upper Pasang, sitting high above Lower Pasang, offered some incredible mountain views. We had started to really feel the effects of altitude, with the thin air and freezing temperatures at night. This marked the beginning of the upper portion of the Manang district, home to about 5,000 in six main villages. The region is in the rain shadow of the Annapurna Range, where the people raise wheat, barley, buckwheat, potatoes and beans. The cold, arid climate limiting them to a single crop annually. There are two routes to Manang, a lower one that follows the valley floor, and a more strenuous but far more scenic higher route, which we of course took instead. The views of Annapurna 2 and 3 were incredible, and spending a night in Nagawao would help us to acclimatize as we made our way towards Thoronglā. We reached the normally bustling village of Manang, which sits atop a plateau below the summits of Annapurna and Gangapurna, less than eight kilometers away, to find it all but deserted. At an early checkpoint, we were told that only five or six had started the trek the day that we did. In the high season, this would normally be over 200.
The eastern half of the town is lined with lodges, trekking shops, and even a video cafe, most of which were closed for the season. The medieval western old town, a compact bundle of 500 flat roofed houses, separated by narrow alleyways. We stayed in one of the few hotels still open for business, where we met up with a few of the friends we'd made along the way, who we had planned to celebrate Christmas with. We were able to get in touch with our friends and family back home over the holidays via two-way GPS text messages, allowing them to track our progress online along the way. So we stocked up on Roxy, a Nepali homebrew, for dollars a liter from a local shopkeeper, and settled in. The plan was to spend the next two days acclimatizing for the higher elevations to come. Although you could easily spend several days here exploring all the amazing sites nearby. Braga is said to be one of the most picturesque villages in the Annapurnas. With most of the village's 200 houses stacked one atop the other, each with an open veranda formed by the neighbor's rooftop. I had been going out for short runs in the afternoon after we were done trekking for the day to further acclimatize and keep up my fitness. Something I continued until we hit about 4,100 meters, where I found I'd get a headache if I tried to push too hard. Nepal is a trail runner's dream and there's even a trail race covering the entire Annapurna circuit that I've added to my bucket list. We had heard from a porter in Manang that it was forecast for snow within a few days, around the time that we'd hoped to go through the pass. The pass is usually snowbound from mid-December to late February, but snow can block the pass at any time of the year. In October of 2014, a snowstorm would hit several points along the circuit, claiming the lives of 32 trekkers from several countries and stranding hundreds others, many of whom had to be rescued. But today, on the trek from Menang to Yak Karka, we were treated to countless displays of nature at its finest.
hordes of crow-like birds and large Himalayan griffins, the largest and heaviest bird found in the Himalayas, with a wingspan up to 10 feet, circled above throughout the day. Horses are still an important means of transport in the relatively flat upper portion of the Manang Valley, where blue sheep and sometimes snow leopards are said to magically appear. People have long used the trail through Thoronglad to bring herds of sheep and yaks in and out of Manang. Hotels were charging very little, if anything at all, provided we commit to purchasing dinner, which was typically just a few dollars for dal bat, an all-you-can-eat rice, lentil, and vegetable dish with chutney, pickle, and roti. Accommodations were rustic, but more than sufficient after a long day on the trail. continued on up the narrowing valley, past landslides, and through occasional gusts of wind that threatened to blow us right off the trail. We had run into some hikers who had gone through Thorong La from the other direction, and who warned of extremely heavy winds over the pass the day before.
Thorong Petty sits surrounded by vertical cliffs about an hour below the high camp above at 4,850 meters. The lodges can get quite crowded here in the high season, especially if snow has backed up traffic over the pass, and nights can be miserable because of the altitude and early departure. Since we would have to leave here by 4 a.m., and given how much time this would add to our summit attempt and how windy it normally gets later in the afternoon, we decided to press on. This would be the highest we'd slept yet, and after just a few hours of potentially dealing with headaches and nausea, we'd be making our final push up to Thorong La Pass. We took one last long look at the views to the east and hoped for good weather in the morning. We woke up again to clear skies, having beat the snow despite our late season attempt at the pass. Now the only challenge would be contending with the altitude. It takes most between three to five hours to reach the summit. But the altitude and the many false summits can make the climb feel like it goes on forever. 50 meters to go. Oh, it's gotta be it up there. Oh, come on. Are you kidding me? It's gotta be it just over that hill. There it is. we'd finally reached the wide Thorong La at an altitude of 5,416 meters. From here, we could see the Great Barrier Ridge, which separates the drier Tibet-like region of Manang from the rest of Nepal. All that was left now was to drop 1,600 meters straight down to Muktinath. and the luxury of having our first warm shower in almost two weeks. After a night in Muktanath, we continued on to the medieval village of Kagbeni, which sits in a green oasis at the junction of two rivers. The trek down the barren Kali Gandaki Valley is said to be in a state of flux. With jeeps and minibuses now shuttling up the valley all the way to Muktanath, many dismissed the trek at this point as being over. There was even evidence of road construction snaking its way from Muktinath up to Throng La Pass. Mountain bikers have already started to tackle the route, some even riding the entire circuit, carrying their bikes for large sections of the Menang side. Certainly fewer walk up the valley compared to even just a few years back. But as in other areas, the network of alternate trails take you away from the road, some said to offer some of the prettiest landscapes and views in the valley. And, as with the other alternate routes, the limited number of lodges and trekkers give it the feeling of trekking 20 years ago. Kagbeni still feels like a medieval village, with its closely packed mud houses, dark tunnels and alleys. As the gateway to Upper Mustang, this is the furthest north you can venture without a restricted area permit. From there, we walked on to Johnson to meet up with a few groups of trekkers we'd met along the way to celebrate New Year's Eve before catching a flight back to Pokhara 
early the following morning. Road construction will certainly continue to change this trek over the years to come. Lodges may begin to close as new day hikes become more accessible, shifting the focus of tourism from through trekkers to day trippers. But as new areas around Annapurna continue to be open for trekkers, like the Upper Mustang region, there's hope still that these can replace the charm that continues to be eroded by the construction of roads. No matter what route you choose, the people, the culture, and the incredible landscapes on the Annapurna circuit are sure to combine for an experience like no other.